might look a bit boring, but they actually have a really interesting history in England. So in the mid 18th century, we were in the middle of an industrial revolution that required ungodly amounts of coal and steel and iron, impossible amounts. But the brilliant minds of the time came up with a solution. Artificial rivers that could just float all this stuff around the country like a, a grand mechanical bloodstream. And do you know what happened? The f we invented trains. And trains are just better than canals, which means we didn't have any use for these. We've got 2,000 miles of, of ponds that, that are just home to waterlogged hippies and corpses and shopping trolleys. Today on Shut Up and Sit Down, we're reviewing Brass, a game about building canals, supposedly a classic. Sometimes those classics are bollocks though, so let's see what we think. Alright, let's go. This renowned 2007 game is about working to transform the face of Lancashire in Northern England, as players compete to turn cottage industries into smoke-belching, labour-multiplying, money-stuffed powerhouses. You're going to build mines, factories and ports, you're going to link them all up with canals, and then halfway through the game you're going to remove all the canals and have to link everything up again with trains because the canals are at capacity. Basically, think of it like Ticket to Ride went to college in Manchester and got addicted to Adderall. You see, while this might have been the pinnacle of design 10 years ago, now a rules explanation is full of those words you never want to hear. Unless, except, and in this case. I'm going to keep this as simple as possible for you guys. Each player gets a hand of eight cards, and on your turn, you're going to do two actions. To do each action, you have to choose a card to discard, and what's printed on those cards is sometimes relevant and sometimes not. It doesn't matter unless you are building a facility on the board. Okay, buckle up. So playing a game of brass is all about putting these facilities on the board in little slots, but winning a game of brass is about making sure these facilities are in use, which enables you to flip the tile onto its back revealing some figures that will increase your income and your victory points later on. So how do you flip tiles? Well, you can build five kinds of facilities. Each one is flipped in a different way. Coal mines and iron mines, which we have here, get a certain number of cubes on them when you build them. And as other facilities eat up those cubes, nom 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 nom, plucking sort of these industrial grapes off the board, when all the cubes are gone from a facility, it is flipped. So flipping your minds is about figuring out what there's demand for and ensuring you fulfill it. Coal has to be taken from the closest source of coal and has to be linked to the place taking the coal via canals. They don't actually have to be your canals, more on that later. Iron can just be taken from anywhere. Uh, then we've got cotton mills. Cotton mills are a really good source of income and victory points. But to flip them, you have to sell at a port, which is the fourth type of facility. If a cotton mill is connected via links all the way to a port for an action, any player can sell their cotton and then flip the port as well. And again, this doesn't have to be your port. So you're flipping someone else's tile for them, which is good for you and good for them. More on that later. Uh, finally, the fifth type is shipyards. And shipyards, shipyards, when you build them, they just insta-flip. <laughs> making you a load of victory points and almost no money. Funny thing about shipyards, they make so many victory points, but they also put a dent in your income with a sledgehammer. Boom! But there's only a limited number of shipyard spaces on the board, so players will probably be fighting for them, even though the person who gets it will end up not wanting it. Just two more points to make on uh, points and how you win. So is it the case that canals are just like the sewer pipes that no one really wants to build but everyone has to? No, canals are actually worth a victory point for every flipped facility near them. So only a canal in the middle of an industrial hub of all your friends is going to earn your points. Also... Everyone is going to arrange their facilities in stacks like so, from lowest tech to highest tech. And as you build facilities off the top, you are slowly going to work your way towards tiles that are worth less, 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 
less income and more victory points, which is naturally how you'd want a game of brass to go. So actually brass is kind of encouraging you to specialize, which is hard when all types of facilities need to be on the board. I should also mention that that's not always the case. You have to look through your own stacks to see which buildings get more expensive to build with time, which generate more VPs, which generate more income, and how much these integers change as you jump from tech level to tech level. Cue all of your friends panically looking at their tiles as they realize just what kind of a game they're in for. Finally, we arrive back at the beginning of the rules explanation, which is what you can actually do on your turn with this hand of cards. You can discard a card to uh, build a link somewhere for a few puns. You can discard a card to sell cotton at a port or the risky distant market, which might mean you've completely wasted your turn. You can discard a card to take a loan, which decreases your income, meaning net you lose money, but you do take a lot of money you can use to get more money. And everyone will be doing this. The only question is how much you take and when you do it. And finally, ooh, no, you can discard a card. And again, the card you're discarding doesn't matter. To uh, take some iron off the board or the iron market and then burn tiles off the top of some of your stacks, giving you access to higher tech stuff. That's pretty good to do if you don't like the board state or you're trying to flip an iron mine. Uh, and finally, you can actually discard a card. And this is where they become relevant to build a facility somewhere because either you have to use a location card and you can only build in that location. Or you can discard a specific industry card and a specific industry card allows you to build only that kind of industry on either side of one of your links. Just a couple more things worth knowing before we begin properly. In the first age, the canal age, each player can only build one facility in each town, which is gonna force you and your friends to start cozying up and start getting annoyed with each other. Another rule worth knowing is the amount of delicious metal poons you spend goes into this box, and that box determines turn order. So the person who builds the most and creates the most opportunities on the board is gonna go last next turn. Phew. Don't worry if you don't understand all the geography on this board, by the way. Uh, we'll, we'll walk you through what some of these traditional English towns are famous for. Imagine your friends doing their shift in the coal mines of this game's rules explanation. Bearing in mind, I've given you a really potted version, you know, without talking about the cotton demand track or these demand tracks or the weird distant city spaces or in fact any of Brass's 15 listed easy to forget rules. But here's the thing, your friends are going to leave their shift in that coal mine and they are immediately going to start blinking in the daylight genius of why this game is so clever. Because they're going to take their first turn and they're going to realize there's no obvious path to victory. And that, that, listen to me, that is part, the first part of why Brass has driven itself into the hearts of so many board gamers like a railroad spike. Now we're into the fun stuff and I'm going to celebrate by eating this traditional English sticky toffee pudding. Sticky, what did I just say? It's a sticky toffee pudding, it's good. Uh, so, let's say the game starts and I spend one, two, three pounds building a canal. Mm, mm, okay. So I build a canal there because Manchester's a big industrial center, it's gonna be worth points for connecting. But then another player on their turn, because hey, half the work's already done, builds a port. And then a third player on their turn builds a cotton mill, because we've got a ready connection there. And then, hey, because no one else has built it yet, I build a coal mine because maybe maybe up here. No, maybe down here. Because there's connections and there's gonna be industries around here. And then people can use my coal. And then maybe I can specialize towards coal. You see how this works? You see how everyone's plans are sort of crawling all over each other like snakes at a swingers party? Oh. Yeah, yeah, but you see how beautiful and elegant this is? Oh, hang on, hang on. Hmm, you see? Can you, can you think of a more sort of wonderful and neat way and beautiful way to, to honor, to honor the, the north of England? I'm just gonna put that in my mouth. 
You see, brass is an economic game where every lick of profit you guys can make comes from how you build together. It is incredibly interactive for an economy, economy, economy building game. And that's so much more fun. You're really playing with your friends. But now you've got the theory. Ignore everything I just showed you because let me show you how the game actually works when you play it. Let's say, again, I start by building a canal, right? Same example. And instead of building there, though, maybe you say, F that, because if you build here, you're going to give me victory points. So maybe you want to build somewhere else. Maybe you can't build there because you don't have the cards. Or maybe you simply don't want to invest in ports. You see, this is the game, weighing up, turning a profit by using your friend's facilities by not wanting to give them money either. It is an impossible calculation. In this example, maybe. Red the Red player instead jumps up north and decides to build their port in Fleetwood and build a canal here, outwards. And then it's a race to see which player can coax the Red player into selling their cotton north or south. Simply put, the reason Brass is such a clever and impossible puzzle game is that the fastest way to make pots of pounds and points is to figure out what, <clears throat> what industries are needed and then provide. So why don't you just sit back and notice, for example, that your friends are all building cotton mills and then buy up all the ports. Your friends need coal and then dig a coal mine. Well, your friends are going to be trying to do that too. And they know what their plans are before you do. So you're already lagging behind. And also, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's very few spaces on this board. You know, there's even less links. So you need to preempt industries. You need to think, oh, I bet people are gonna go for cotton mills next. So I'll buy the ports now. Except, obviously, whenever you build anything, you're discouraging other players from using your facilities. So if you buy up all the ports, you'll drive your friends away from building the cotton mills that you assumed were going to exist. It's nuts. What's also really interesting and quite nice is that when you start playing brass, with that virgin board where no one has any idea what to do, it's uh, it's like the possibility space you'd find in a Go board, you know, the game of Go, where you can do anything and go anywhere, and it's a bit too big, frankly. But then the game cramps down with incredible speed as everyone buys up all the spaces, and also, <laughs> you, the, the age ends when no one has any cards left, so you use two, and you redraw, but then for your last few turns of each age, you go from eight cards to six, and then to four, and then to two, and you have to play those two. So by the end of an age, a game of brass is like, trying to realize your plans is like trying to squeeze a dog through a cat flap. But then all the links get plucked off the board again. And then you build again in the second age, and you can replace old antiquated buildings with new ones. Until again in the second age, it, it cramps down, so it goes big, small, big, small until you've got a, not that much fun actually, final few turns where you can do nothing and everyone's just trying to squeak out a few more pounds as if they were trying to squeeze water from, from well, a piece of coal. This is the thorny reality of brass. It's a lot more like, well, porcupines at a swingers party. You are crawling all over each other, but you're doing so very carefully and sometimes painfully. I mean, if brass is a masterpiece, and I'm not saying it's not, it's a masterpiece in the same way that you can go to a gallery and look at some beautiful Renaissance painting and just stare at it and think and think about what it means and what you should do. But you better make sure your friends have the same interest in fine art as you or they're going to be bored out of their minds. I mean, you're doing a lot of maths and a lot of guesstimation and a lot of thinking or you're playing, well, or you're not playing at all, really. Look, here are my friends and I playing brass. And do you notice something? Usually when I show B-roll of my friends and I playing a game, we're talking and laughing, but no. I mean, when we finished this game of Brass, we high-fived with joy because it had been such a slog. And it's not the first time I've done that with a game, but it is the first time it's happened in years. And look, in the simplest possible way, this footage is your Brass review. Do you want a super serious time with your friends? Brass is for you. How did you get rid of the iron? Uh, I used two to uh, get rid of... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's not ideal, but my god, if this game isn't every bit as deep as everyone says it is. I imagine Martin Wallace doing this pose from the cover when he sent the game off to the printers. I mean, the maths in it is so opaque, it's just 
it's so difficult to figure anything out. I mean, take developing, you know, a relatively simple action of spending your turn taking two tiles off the top to get to some better integers below. When is that better than actually taking up real estate on the board and blocking your friends? Oh my god, or let's just talk about loans, right? Let's talk about the ridiculous numbers involved in working out when to take a loan. On this track, you're going to be measuring your income with these nice little discs, and you're going to be measuring your victory points, which is a man with a top hat, waving his top hat and presumably shouting, Yay! I'm richer than you! So, you can take a loan for one of your precious actions in brass, getting you 10, 20, or even 30 pounds, because even though this will actually net lose you money over the game, you can spend that 30 pounds on, for example, coal mines, they're gonna make you, you know, 10 times as much as the loan's interest. Welcome to the dark heart of capitalism. People who are allowed to have money can have even more money when they invest it. If you find it depressing, here's a delicious eaten mess. But here's the problem. When you flip a tile, you're gonna move that many spaces up this track, but the colored bands show when you actually increase your income. So we go from eight pounds a turn to nine pounds a turn, and then the further you go up the track, the more points you have to get from flip tiles to actually increase your income. Loans don't decrease you a number of spaces, they decrease you a number of bands. Meaning, because the bands are much smaller at the beginning, it makes more sense to take loans at the start of the game. In other words, when you don't need the money. So even Brass's simplest action, which is take loans when you need money, isn't that simple. Again, this is something you have to weigh against the board state. If you don't think you can do something useful this turn, maybe it's time to decrease your income for a wad of cash that you'll need to spend? Are you gonna eat that? No? Awesome, that's, oh, hang on, oh. It's not, it didn't really open. Hang on, let me just, I like eating mess, but I'm always reminded of like someone's bedroom in Oxford where it's like, oh, Eaton, you've made such a mess. Fa, 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 fa. That was a window into my brain you didn't need. Make no mistake that while the figure on brass is heroic, it will turn you into the worst kind of industrialist where you, uh, you, you build businesses because you forget you already own one or where you stop taking pleasure in the simple things, you know? The, so the puzzle in brass is so psychologically pungent that you will very quickly stop taking joy in the metal money in this game. You won't even notice it. You won't notice the evocative story that this game tells when the beautiful grass and hills of Northern England is turned into a, into a brickwork, stinking boiler room, you know? No, this game, you will only see numbers very quickly. So that's Brass, one of board games classics, and I am not here to argue that this is a game that you couldn't play a hundred times and still be discovering new things about it, still be figuring out. It's fantastic. But do we recommend you buy it? And do we still think it's a classic? And for me, Brass resembles nothing more than an old car from the 1950s. Nothing more and nothing less, you know? I can admire its beautiful curvature and see the innovation present within. Doesn't mean I want to buy one, doesn't mean I recommend it, doesn't mean I even want to drive one. It's going to be slow and it's going to be bumpy. You see, you find games like Brass, like Dominant Species, like Twilight Struggle, really high up in Board Game Geek's top 100, and it's been put there by diehard board gamers, the same people that kept this hobby alive in the 80s and 90s, and to whom we have, like, to thank for our industry today. But... In 2016, I mean, like with my old car analogy, that's kind of ridiculous. This game only came out 10 years ago. But like in those 10 years, we've now got more games and types of games and people and types of people. People like you playing board games that we never had before. And the competition is astronomical. And today, already, Brass feels too slow and too awkward to keep up with that competition. And no, I don't necessarily recommend you buy it. I would guess that only 5% of Shut Up and Sit Down's audience would play this and really get a kick out of it, you know? It's exhausting to teach. It's kind of exhausting to play. And it doesn't give a lot back. Oh, and there is an awful lot of this. I'll, um, if I pay 15 pounds for the, for the double railroad, then what I can do, oh no, I don't have the money. I'm really, I'm so sorry. Just, just give me, give me a moment. Okay, I'll, I'll build a, I'll build a cotton, mi oh no. I'm really, I'm really sorry everyone. Just give me a second. Okay, I've got it everyone. I'm sorry, sorry that took ages. I'm gonna play the Manchester card and five pounds and put a railroad there. Then I'm gonna use this coal mining card to put 
uh, coal mine at the other end of that link. Oh, you can't actually do that because there's no coal. Right, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm gonna just take all that back. Just give me a give me a minute. Actually, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. You know, what I'm actually gonna do is, uh, is I'm just gonna do this. So there you have it. We probably, maybe definitely don't recommend Brass. If you want a heavy, complex strategy game, Terra Mystica is still good, but if you want something similar to this, but with a tenth of the rules, get Power Grid. Or if you want something kind of similar to this, but with a tenth of the rules, and that's fun, I love Concordia to pieces. Oh, and if you just want to put like imaginary people in really, really awful jobs in your strategy games, then uh, Village is still excellent. You know what though? Just being sat here next to this board, looking at it, reviewing it, I do want to play this game again. I want to tease apart its mysteries and take everything I learn from it and get better and tell I have an industry that dominates the North. But, but I mean, a few things, right? First off, I don't think my friends want to play this with me again. Second off, I don't think I want to teach new people because I'd probably be better, them, better than them and that rules explanation is a pain. I mean, I've just got better stuff to play most of all. It's just like Brass teaches us with its history with those stupid canals. Good stuff will always come over and replace you. That's just human history. Good, better games, faster games, younger games. Have replaced brass. Nothing will replace shut up and sit down though. No. No way, no way will actually get old at all, ever. Mm -hmm.